Well, as I say, thank you very much for your invitation. It's a real pleasure to be able to be here and talk to you about an approach to teaching and learning, which is not brand new, but it's something that I have been thinking about, and it's been about 20 years in the making. First of all, exploring the science. That's my background. I'm a cognitive scientist, an experimental psychologist, and I'm interested in finding out more and more about the brain and the mind and about how people's minds can be helped to become more powerful and more effective. And that's my scientific background. But for the last 10 years or so, I've been working with an increasing number. Now, I couldn't tell you how many. Thousands of teachers, hundreds of schools, dozens of local authorities to find smart, practical ways in which those well-founded scientific ideas can be translated into doable and effective things in the classroom. Well, what is it that we're trying to discover? In a way, it's, I think of it as being a bit like the holy grail of education. Trying even more than we currently do to find ways of organising our schools, talking to our children, planning lessons, working with each other, to achieve a combination of these objectives. Yes, raising results according to the conventional standards, the key stage two SATs are important, and doing that in a way that increases young people's levels of engagement and enjoyment in their learning, not doing that in a way that makes school an anxious grind or drudgery or something that they dread or something that is a pressure, and doing that in a way that makes our jobs as teachers more pleasurable, more enjoyable, more even more than they currently are, the job that you really came into the profession to do. And, notice the ands are all in capital letters there, and to do that in a way that really helps all young people develop the confidence, the capacity, and the appetite to go out into the big wide world and face difficult, complicated things, the specific nature of which we cannot predict because the world is changing very fast, but face uncertainty and complexity with that confidence and with that capacity. As many people are saying these days, to be powerful, confident, <coughs> lifelong learners. What do we mean by it? What are we interested in? We mean exactly what I've been saying, don't we? That capacity, that appetite, that confidence to be able to learn whatever you need to learn, to solve whatever you need to solve, and to also not only to be able to cope with the challenges that life throws at you, but also to be able to select and pursue your own challenges. How does school become a place not just where children learn, but where they learn how to learn, where they become more independent, more confident, more capable, more curious in their own right? Well, the first thing we know very clearly is that what doesn't work is good old-fashioned teaching, where the teacher does all the work, where we do all the marking, where we do all the organising, where we do all the driving and planning and uh, designing of the whole educational experience. There's a very effective way of doing that. It's called spoon-feeding, isn't it? Spoon feeding is a good way of increasing your standards, increasing your level of results, but it has an unfortunate side effect, spoon feeding. It has the side effect of creating young people, not young people who are more independent, but young people who are more dependent. Not young people who are more curious and imaginative, but young people who are more docile and receptive. So there are ways of raising results which don't automatically achieve the bottom line, my fourth requirement of making young people more thoughtful, more curious, more imaginative, more independent, more collaborative in their learning. Then we thought maybe we could do this lifelong learning thing with a little bit of tinsel sprinkled over the, the normal business of education. A few little hints and tips that we could do that we could just kind of mix in to the normal business of school. What do I mean? Are things like the bottles of water and the visual auditory and kinesthetic learning styles and the mind maps and the, the little tricks and techniques. Have you been there? Yes? Do all your kids know how to do mind maps? 
Slightly less of a, yeah? Are they all sipping water? Yes, you've had the water thing. Now, you have to be careful about this. I mean, these are useful. It's useful to be able to do a mind map. But I've discovered something very interesting. You can be taught to do mind maps mindlessly. <laughs> my, uh, my wife's family come from Northern Ireland. And uh, we were over there a little while ago. And I was talking to her niece, Charlotte, who goes to school in Coleraine. Anybody from Coleraine here? No? Goes to school in Coleraine. And I said to her, have you done mind maps in your school? She said, yes. Uh, I said, could you do one for me? She said, sure. She's an obliging little girl. She's 10. So she sat, got a piece of paper and she sat down and she produced this fabulous mind map of the animal kingdom. Really fast and really well. It was like all the lines were the, were the right length and invertebrates were spelt correctly. And she even had times a little illustration of a snail and a duck and a giraffe. Why a snail, a duck and a giraffe? I don't know. And I was very impressed. She did it in about three minutes. She did this. I was very impressed. And I was slightly suspicious. I said to her, have you done, have you done this one before? She said, oh, yes, lots. <laughs> she said, that's our teacher's favorite. <laughs> I said to her, forgive the accent. I said to her, um, well, let's do, a different, let's do a new one. Let's do one you haven't done before. Why don't we do one for, um, for your mum's cooking or for the different kinds of music that you like or something like that? There was a long pause while Charlotte sort of looked at her toes and did that thing that girls do. Uh, and then she said, not making eye contact, she said, I think I'll go out and play on the trampoline. No. <laughs> it was perfectly clear to me that she hadn't learned how to use mind map. She hadn't learned how to think about mind map. She hadn't learned to see herself as a mind map maker. She just learned to do a few. She'd learned another performance for pleasing grown-ups. Now, I think that's a waste of a useful little technique and a waste of a little girl's time, don't you? Charlotte has enough ways of pleasing grown-ups already. So we went through a phase, didn't we, where, which was sort of pretty lightweight, pretty kind of on the surface about this kind of stuff. And we did the learning styles thing. Again, learning styles are very useful. Have you been through VAK? Yeah. Yes? What does VAK stand for? It's short for vacuous. <laughs> it's, it, I, it's useful. I mean, it's useful if you use it to get children thinking about how they learn. Yeah? It's not so useful if what happens at the end of the lesson is that all the kids walk out of the classroom with another label stuck on their head. I'm an auditory learner. <laughs> Teacher told me the other day she was covering a lesson. A boy said to her, don't ask me to read that book for ten minutes, miss. I'm a kinesthetic learner. <laughs> Actually, someone pointed out to me the other day, kinesthetic is code for naughty, isn't it, really? <laughs> Now, I don't, know, I, I don't know what you think, but I think that yeah, this is a, not a young man. This, I don't ask me to read that book, character. This is not a young man who's been challenged to become more thoughtful or more self-aware or more flexible or more various in his learning. He's just been labelled and stuffed into a box, hasn't he? His development as a learner has been kind of restricted. It's been stuck rather than something that has been, he's been challenged to expand. If you sit kids down and ask them about their learning styles, they will perfectly happily tell you that they're not the same learner when they're doing their footy as when they're doing their maths. They're different. They know perfectly well that they're more various, which is what the research shows as well, that we are all more various across time and space and different kinds of activities than that simplistic view of learning styles would have us believe. But if you use that notion as a way of beginning to get them thinking about themselves and challenge to be how can I become more of the other things rather than how can I just become stuck with the one thing, that's helpful. So the learning styles doesn't really doesn't do it, although it can be a useful contribution. Then we went through a phase where we thought we could turn this learning and thinking business into subject matter and teach it. I sat in a lesson not long ago, this was a year eight lesson in a comprehensive school, where they were doing the multiple intelligences. Have you done the multiple intelligences? You know Howard Gardner? Yeah. Multiple intelligences. Eight and a half there are now. You know that? Yeah, the half is spiritual. He's not quite sure whether it's a proper intelligence or not. I could tell him. But. And, the, and the children in this, in this year eight class, they were sitting there and what they were doing was parroting back little sort of expressions, little formulae that corresponded to each of the multiple intelligences. The teacher was going, now who can tell me what body smart is? And she said to me, Brendan, I think, can tell us. She said, Brendan's our kinesthetic learner. He's a bit fidgety, aren't you, Brendan? <laughs> that was the kind of depth to which, it, to which it went in that class. 
And so they were going around parroting back these little slogans. I, I swear to you that as far as the, the children's development, as far as their ways of thinking were concerned, for all, the, for all the difference this knowledge made to them, they might just as well have been rehearsing the five industrial preparations of sulfuric acid. It was a very dull lesson. It was just more, you know, learning and, learning and regurgitating, more catechism of call and response in the classroom. So it's perfectly possible, isn't it, to become more knowledgeable about multiple intelligences without becoming one jot more multiply intelligent. Do you agree? Yeah? I mean, we're all, you're all knowledgeable about things you're not very good at, aren't you? Aren't you? I am. Yeah? I'm quite knowledgeable about rugby union. I'm looking forward to the game on Saturday. But I'm really lousy at it. Always was, always will be. No chance now. Yeah? So um, it's perfectly possible to have the knowledge, but not to manifest it, not to use it in real life. And the other problem, of course, is that we then thought, well, we could turn this stuff into skills. We could train it. So we have learning to learn courses or critical thinking skills lessons or personal learning and thinking skills. Now we're getting closer, we're getting better, at least that's better than the tinsel, the little bits of tinsel sprinkling on. Sprinkling on. But there's, another, there's a problem with the skills agenda and that's this. Let me ask you a question, uh, any of you. Can you play the piano? Okay, don't be shy. Doesn't matter to what level, can you play the piano? Put your hand up. Okay? Is that all? <laughs> Who can play the piano but doesn't want to say? <laughs> I mean, in case they get asked to do something. <laughs> if they get picked on. Okay, so some of you. Some of you can play the piano. Okay, let me ask you a different question. Do you play the piano? Different question, isn't it? Yeah? It's perfectly possible to be able to play the piano and not do so. It's perfectly possible to be able to think better and not do so. It's perfectly possible to have learning skills and not use them, isn't it? And now I just want to, I want to kind of give you some quick examples uh, about what these different cultural aspects... What, what am I talking about? This metaphor about iron filings and sticks and seaside rock and what have you. What am I talking about? I'm talking about... The language that we use as we talk to... Oh, there was a little red dot on this, but it's not... Can you see a little red dot? I can't. No, never mind. It doesn't matter. Uh, the language that we use as we talk to children informally, formally, and so on. The example that we set, you'll see that this make, neatly makes the acronym LEARN down the, down the side there. The language that we use, the example that we set, what we think it's appropriate to show the children of ourselves, particularly of ourselves as learners, the way we design activities, do we set them up to deliberately expand and stretch their, their learning confidence and learning capacity or not? The way we organise the resources and the environment, as I say, the access that we give children to the resources, or the way we set up the visual environment around the school, or the way we lay out the furniture, all these things carry different messages. They have, technically, what psychologists would say, they have different affordances. They allow the children to do different kinds of things. And the, finally is what I, what I call noticing and monitoring, which is how much responsibility, how do, how, what do we value of the children's development and how do we capture that? How do we involve them in the designing of their own educational experience? My friend Caroline Lodge teachers at the Institute of Education in London. And she was interested in the extent to which teachers who said they were interested in learning, you're interested in learning, aren't you? Yeah? Teachers who said they were interested in learning actually talked about learning with the children. So she did a little study. She sat at the back of a whole lot of teachers' classrooms and she counted up the number of times that teachers, just as they were going about their normal business of working with the children and setting things up and keeping them going and chatting to them, the number of times they used two words. One word was the word learning, or learn, or learner, variations like that. And the other was the word work. And then she just added them all up and turned them into percentages. So what do you think? Now, this probably doesn't apply in Croydon in 2009. This was a range of outer London boroughs in 2004, this study was done. But what do you think? Of every hundred times that teachers were using one or other of those words, how much was it learning and how much was it work? What do you think? 
Any, anybody willing to go for a percentage? Hands up. What do you think? Yeah? Seven, which way around? 70% work, 30% learning. I love optimists. <laughs> Ninety-five to five. The room is full of optimists. Ninety-eight <laughs> percent work, two percent learning. These were teachers who said they were interested in learning, but actually, when you just sat at the back of the classroom, what you heard, if you were to kind of sort of caricature, speed it up a little bit, was much more like, "What's your work? Get on with your work. Get down to your work. Get back to your work. How's your work coming on? Get on with your work. Get back to your work. Get on with your work. Get, on, get on with your work. Get back to your work. What's your work? Get on with your work. Get back to your work." So the notion of work was the was dominant organizing concept of the classroom. Now, what am I saying? I'm not saying go back into your classrooms and start saying to your children, get on with your learning, get back to your learning, get down to your learning. How's, it, <laughs> how's your learning coming on? That would be silly, wouldn't it? That would be merely cosmetic, if that, as a shift. So what am I saying? I'm saying, is it possible a little bit more than you currently do, and just check a little bit more than you currently do, to make the chat in the classroom about the process of learning? The thing about, there's nothing wrong with the word work. It's a perfectly useful word. It means more, roughly a more or less disagreeable activity undertaken to achieve a task, doesn't it? <laughs> to achieve an outcome. That's roughly what work means. I'll give you a clue. What's the opposite of work? Play. Play. See, you know what I mean? Now, but what am I going on about? Does this, does this matter? Does it make a difference? Ellen Langer is another psychologist at Harvard, so you have to believe it's true, right? It's come out of Harvard, this. So it's going to be true. She did, a, she did another little experiment in which she gave exactly the same task to two groups of children. For one group, she called it work, and for the other group, she called it play. Guess which group worked harder? <laughs> Guess which group were more engaged? Guess which group learned more? See? The words matter. Words matter, they make a big difference. So I'm saying, can you build up, model and build up in your classroom more of, how do we do that? What was difficult about that? How could I have helped you learn that? How could you have helped me learn that better? How could I, make that, how could I have made that easier for myself? How could I make that harder for myself? How was that group over there going about it? And was that different from that group? And which was a, which was a good way? Has anybody got a really good way of doing those sums that it will be useful for the rest of us to know? That's... What, what, what I, I like making up silly words, so I call that talking learnish. So do you talk learnish in your classroom? Do you talk learnish to your own children? There's a famous story, a Nobel Prize winning scientist, you may have heard this story, I can't remember his name. He grew up in a Jewish area in New York. He went to school and he was reminiscing about what got him going on being such a world-breaking, imaginative, ingenious, successful scientist. And, he's, and he said when he was being interviewed, he said, do you know, I think one of the things that made a difference, when I came home from school every day and I was five years old, every other kid on the block, their mother said to them, what did you learn at school today? He said, but not my mum. My mum said to me, Moshe, did you ask a good question today? That's the process, isn't it? That's being engaged in the learning process, not completing tasks. Yeah? So do we value the questioning? Do we value the, how do we get more strategic? How do we learn more about learning around here? OK, now if you're, if you're interested in this, I will tell you, you won't believe me, but I will tell you that I've, a number of teachers have come back to me and said, you know that thing you said in your lecture about learning versus work? They said, well, I went back to my class and I, and I started doing that. Or I went back to our school and we talked about it and we made a decision about it. And they said, do you know you wouldn't believe what a difference that made? That's the first one, first little thing. The example that we set. When I was at school, a very, very, very long time ago, my teachers were perfectly clear. They never even thought about it. They just knew absolutely that it was their top professional responsibility to be knowers to be knowledgeable, to be secure in knowing the difference between a colon and a semicolon, 
or an acid and a base, or the causes of the First World War, or the colours of the rainbow in the right sequence, or what the Vikings wore on their heads. It was their job to know that, right? And that was what they modelled. They modelled knowingness the whole time. So much so that they didn't like it if they ever didn't know anything. I remember once asking one of my physics teachers, we were doing Newton's second law. Remember Newton's second law? Force equals mass times acceleration. And he told us that mass wasn't the same as weight. So I said, well, what is mass, sir? Mr. Hickson, sir, what is mass? What is it really? He pointed to the equation on the board and said, force equals mass times acceleration, Claxton. I said, no, but what is it? What is it really? I haven't got, I've got a feel for what mass is. It's not, I know what weight is. It's heaviness, right? But what's mass? What is it? He said, I think you'll find, Claxton, if you divide through both sides of the equation, you'll find that mass equals force divided by acceleration. <laughs> he got really cross. <laughs> now, it's not the best question in the world, but it's not a bad question. It shows the level of engagement. But the best he could do was become increasingly blustery and aggressive and retreat to the textbook definition. He didn't like the fact that there was some territory here that he may not have a ready-made answer to. Now, you're not like that. You understand, you understand, don't you, that if we want children to become good real-life learners, if we want them to become confident finder-outers, people who are happy explorers, people who don't mind, therefore, not knowing, that it becomes our professional responsibility to be visibly not knowers as much of the time as possible. A is for activities. Split-screen thinking. What does that mean? Split screen thinking means that whenever you design a lesson, you have dual objectives. One objective is the stuff, the content, the literacy, the numeracy, the science, whatever it may be. And the other, equally visible, is, and which learning muscle are we going to be stretching today? Which aspect of your capacity as a powerful learner are we going to be developing? Let me tell you... This is, this is a, a quick map. This is the map that we use in Building Learning Power to talk about powerful learners. Powerful learners are emotionally resilient. They're happy to just check off with me in your head if you agree. Someone who's a powerful, confident learner is up for a risk, willing to have a go at something, persists in the face of difficulty, can maintain their focus of concentration, is able to attend closely to things. Yes, do we tick all those? Powerful learners are cognitively resourceful. They like asking questions. They're flexible in their approach to learning. It's like one of you was saying, I think. It's like that, you know, becoming a better learner is having a range of options and being able to manage your own learning. Being, knowing how to balance being imaginative and being critical, for example. Being a powerful learner is being a good sociable learner. It means being a good team player, being able to collaborate, but also being able to be independent. It means, for example, something subtle like in, the, in a discussion being able to maintain your own point of view whilst also being open to other people's. We know a lot of grown-ups who haven't got that one figured out, don't we? Yeah? So uh, being able to put yourself in other people's shoes. Good thing for, for learners, to be able to look at the world through different perspectives. Being able to be supportive, to be a good sounding board or supportive to other people who are learning. And being able to be strategically reflective, being able to stand back and be honest about yourself. These are my strengths, these are my weaknesses, this is what I'm working on building. This is where else I could use what I've just learned. Oh, that's really interesting because I could use it somewhere else, being self-aware. Resources and the environment. Let me give you another little example. What you put on the walls conveys a powerful message about what you value, about learning. What do you select of the children's, and I will use the word, work, because it's to refer to the product, yeah? What goes up on the walls of the children's work? Let me take you into two <coughs> stereotyped primary schools. In primary school A, you walk around, you look in the, in the hall, you walk around the corridors, you look in the classrooms, and everywhere you go, you see beautiful displays of the children's best work. It's excellent. It really is. And you know it's excellent because it's laminated. That's how you know. <laughs> Lamination is the sign, isn't it? This is stop being a draft. This is good. 
can't tinker with it anymore once it's laminated. Okay? So you walk into the third year, they've been doing sunflowers, and there is Rashida's best sunflower, and Ben's best sunflower, and Emma's best sunflower, and Wang Yi's best sunflower, and Ernie's best sunflower. There they all are. Search the wall as you might, you'll find no evidence of their learning journey, no evidence of their progress, no evidence of the drafting, of the struggling, of the ones that didn't quite work. All we're interested in around here is showing off the excellence of the product. It's as if all the learning behind those products is airbrushed out of the visible environment. We're not interested in displaying that in our school. But I could take you into another school, and there are dozens and dozens and dozens of them now, where they, they, uh, they select different kinds of things. Yes, sure enough, there is Rashida's best sunflower. But it's accompanied by two or three of, and these are Rashida's own words, I have to say, of her increasingly less crap sunflowers. <laughs> and Rashida will take you, and Rashida has two things to be proud of. One is where she's got to, the last one, and the other is she can say, look, I couldn't get the yellow right then, but I can now. See how I couldn't, I couldn't really get the proportions then, but I can now. She, the wall invites her to be proud of her progress, not just her arriving. Finally, the, the, the involvement of students in, um, uh, in the actual running and monitoring of the school. Rena Keeble is the head of a first school in uh, Harrow, Cannon Lane First School in Harrow, northwest London. She, uh, her children write the school development plan. They really do. It's written in child, they've just had an outstanding Ofsted. It's written in child speak. They've set the, the targets, with some help, of course, and a bit of guidance. They've set the targets and the objectives. One of their targets is, it's a very nice one, the children said, uh, we want our school to be a place where you will still be here in four years' time. Because we like you and we like stability. So then they've said, so what do we have to do as the children in order to make it a place where you're going to want to stay? And what do you have to do to help to make this school a place where you're going to want to stay? And then they've listed a number of objectives of the school. This is not a student council that talks endlessly about the toilets and the vending machines and the peripherals of the school. This is a group of children who are taking some real responsibility for thinking about the place that they, are, that they come to learn, the, way, the, the, the teaching and learning that goes on there. I was in a big primary school in Peterborough. 80% English as a foreign language. English as an additional language, excuse me. In, uh, in this big school in Peterborough. And I sat in on the inaugural meeting of the student senior leadership team. There was a group of 10 students, years 4, 5 and 6, all of whom had applied to be and were accepted to be on the student leadership team because they were acknowledged leaders in some aspect of learning. Some of them were very good at putting themselves in other people's shoes. Some of them were very good at persisting in the face of difficulty. Some of them were very good at asking questions. And they all knew they were very well able to articulate what their learning strengths were and what they were improving on and how they were going to help Mrs. Roof, Karen Roof, the head teacher, how they were going to help Mrs. Roof and her colleagues make it a better school. This is a school where the students very clearly saw themselves not as passengers but as crew. Hmm? So how far are you along that road? It's called, sometimes it's called student voice, but that doesn't do it justice, does it? Students can have a voice and you can not listen to it. And that happens in a lot of schools. But how would you develop that? How far are you down the road of giving, finding all kinds of small, smart, manageable ways in this, this, which the students can take increasing ownership? An increasing sense that they are, they are, what's the fashionable phrase? Co-creating the school with you. Or does it all come ready-made with you?